Good morning. Welcome to St. Andrew Presbyterian Church. To those of you who are here in the sanctuary with us today, and for those of you who are joining us via live stream. As Christ's servants, we glorify God, call, nurture, and equip disciples, and use the gifts of the Holy Spirit to serve those in need. A few announcements today. First of all, I'd like to welcome, um, I think you everybody knows him, Walt Lee, who is filling the pulpit today for our Pastor Doug, who is out on retreat this weekend. Um, today is Stewardship Sunday, and more to come on that soon. Uh, you will hear from Walt more on that. Um, today is Sandy's Extravaganza. And as you came up today, uh, past the walk, you may have seen some tables out there between the sanctuary and fellowship hall. And there are things out there that were in the choir loft that were Sandy's. And Sandy donated them to this church. And we are going to be giving out some raffle tickets at the end of this service. So as you go out either the front door or the side door there by the office, uh, Ginger and Sue will have raffle tickets for you. Um, hold on to those uh, tightly, and you can look at what's on those tables. And if there's something that you really, really just catches your eye and you would like, um, we will be doing that via raffle after church. We will also be uh, keeping the things that have not uh, been taken home uh, for a couple weeks, maybe in the narthex. So those of the people who are not here this week, uh, if you'd like to come in during the week maybe and take a look at them. Um, and then the following week, uh, we can uh, have those f uh, ready for you. So um, you do not have to be here today uh, to actually uh, find something that, that you may like for that. Next week... Um, we have homework for you this week. Next week, nomination forms will go out um, for session, deacons, and uh, members of the nominating committee. So please be thinking about who you would like to uh, recommend for those positions. Now, please remember that those people have to agree with you to be nominated, right? So... Um, we will get those nomination forms out to you soon for the nominating committee to look at. November 16th at 6.30 is our Thanksgiving service. There will not be a Thanksgiving meal this year, but the um, service will be here in our sanctuary along with um, Oak Hills. Inner City uh, toy develop, uh, inner city development toy drive. The box is over here on this side of the sanctuary out past the hallway to bring your nonviolent toys uh, unwrapped uh, for that effort. And the women's bake sale. Uh, is the sign up out in the narthex? Yes, it is. So please sign up uh, for either baking and or buying to support the uh, Presbyterian women of the church. Are there any other announcements? Let us prepare our hearts and minds to worship God. Este mundo abandono, ya 
antes de dar cuenta a Dios aquí para entre los dos mi confesión te diré mi confesión te diré Siempre odiado a ti que tanto te amaba, nunca te perdonaré, nunca te perdonaré. Can I follow that? <laughs> Beautiful, thank you. Please stand and join me to, with the call to worship. Be read responsibly. Come, worship God. Food to the hungry and sets the prisoner free. Come, worship God. Come, worship God. Our first hymn today is a hymn of praise, Rejoice the Lord is King, number 363 in the purple hymnals. Please be seated. We bring ourselves humbly before God to confess our sins. All who are, invite are able can kneel or bow your heads in prayer. Please join me. O oh Christ, you praise the gift over the widow who had so little and gave it all. Forgive us for turning our eyes away from the people who are trapped in poverty. Forgive us for turning our resources 
into reasons for pride or greed. Forgive us, and by your forgiveness, teach us to follow in your way of generosity. Amen. As high as the earth, as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is God's love for us. As far as the east is from the west, so far does God remove our sins from us. In the name of Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Lord, as the scriptures are read today, please open our hearts to hear your word as it is read to us today. Amen. The first scripture reading is from Ruth chapter 3, verses 1 through 10. Please listen for the word of the Lord. Naomi, her mother-in-law, said to her, My daughter, I need to seek some security for you so that it may be well with you. Now here is our kinsman Boaz, with, who, with whose young women you have been working. See, he is winnowing barley tonight at the threshing floor. Now wash and anoint yourself and put on your best clothes and go down to the threshing floor. But do not make yourself known to the man until he has finished eating and drinking. When he lies down, observe the place where he lies. Then go and uncover his feet and lie down, and he will tell you what to do. And she said to her, All that you tell me, I will do. So she went down to the threshing floor and did just as her mother-in-law had instructed her. When Boaz had eaten and drunk and he was in a contented mood, he went to lie down at the end of the heap of grain. Then she came stealthily and uncovered his feet and lay down. At midnight, the man was startled and turned over, and there, lying at his feet, was a woman. He said, Who are you? And she answered, I am Ruth, your servant. Spread your cloak over your servant, for you are next of kin. And he said, May you be blessed by the Lord, my daughter. This last instance of your loyalty is better than the first. You have not gone after young men, whether poor or rich. This is the word of the Lord. We turn again to God's word as it comes to us from the gospel according to Mark, beginning in the 12th chapter with the 38th verse. As he, Jesus, taught... He said, Beware of the scribes who like to walk around in long robes and be greeted with respect in the marketplaces and have the best seats in the synagogue and to place the places of honor at banquets. They devour widows' houses for the sake of appearance, say long prayers. They will receive the greater condemnation. And he sat down opposite the treasury and watched the crowd putting money into the treasury. Many rich people came 
came and put in large sums. A poor widow came and put in two small copper coins, which are worth a penny. Then he called his disciples and he said to them, Truly I tell you, this poor widow has put in more than all of those who are contributing to the treasury. For all of them have, uh, have contributed out of their abundance, but she, out of her poverty, has put in everything she had, all that she had to live on. May God bless the reading of his word. I think somebody has a great sense of irony to take this text and put it out on Stewardship Sunday. Um, I'm sure that church treasurers throughout the denomination and other denominations that are in the stewardship season are having heartburn right now as the challenge uh, to those who give much is not appreciated like that of the widow. Uh, But we do give out of our abundance and we are truly blessed. Um, Last week, Mary and I were on the coast. We uh, had a really relaxing time. Uh, Mary got to walk the beach. My ankles didn't work. We had the dog with us, so we stayed around the place that we were staying a lot. And during that time, we, we did a variety of things, including playing canasta. Uh, Probably not as much as Mary would have liked, but we did play canasta. And I have to tell you that she's a much better player than I am. And not only that, the cards were falling her way. And I was behind. And getting further behind continually as that uh, unfolded, And then there was reversal. The cards began to fall my way. And I had a hand, probably the best hand that I have ever had in a game of canasta. I wound up with six canastas, and if you don't know, that's a bunch. And uh, I had the cards where I could go out, but there was a problem. If I went out, Mary would win the game. She would cross the 5,000 point line because she had two canastas. And so the only thing I could do was go all in and just try to hold on uh, and make more points and surpass her lead. The bottom line is she won. But I won too because while we were playing that game, as I was going through that particular hand, I had some insights into Ruth and the widow. And all of a sudden things clicked for me. And I thought, okay, I know what I'm going to do. Now I realize that I'm playing around the edges of these texts. If I were to address these two texts, the Ruth story and the stories uh, that Mark tells directly, I'd be focusing on the reason that the story of Ruth is in the Bible at all. Um, Ruth is a Moabite. She's a foreigner. She comes in. She's loyal to her mother-in-law but she's also absorbed into, weaved into the fabric of Israel. And not only that, but she serves in the direct line of the ancestors of David and thus of Jesus the Messiah. So it's an important story for that reason, and I'm not going to talk about that part. Likewise, as Jesus sits and observes the treasury His point that he tries to make in so many other places and so many other ways is that those who wish to exalt themselves in the world, in this world or in the next, have little to do with the realm of God 
that Jesus came to reveal. I considered showing up this morning in my doctoral gown with my full academic hood and an elaborate, I don't own an elaborate stole, but I, I thought about going out and finding one somewhere so I could show up with all of the trappings that Jesus seemed to be warning against. Uh, reminds me of a story that I read some time ago about one, but it's a cartoon and one baby's talking to another baby and he says, you'd never believe what happened yesterday. We went to church and a man in a dress tried to drown me. <laughs> and, and my parents were smiling and taking pictures and they didn't do anything to stop it. But that's beside the point. Somehow, I don't think that an academic gown or other things would be really fitting with this morning's text. When Matthew tells the same story, he goes in and uses the words, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees. Between each of these various things, he says, Woe to you who do this and do that. The widow is brought into the story as a contrast to those who waste their privilege privilege of elevated statue in Jesus' day and perhaps ours. So I've told you what I should be talking about, but I'm going to do something different this morning. Instead, I'm going to return to Canasta and to Ruth and to the widow. I told you about Canasta to illustrate a point. Um, in order to even have a chance at some points in life, there are times when you have to go all in. You have to work against your better judgment. There are times when people have to risk everything in order to have a chance. And I think this is an opportunity to think about when we as individuals, as a congregation, as a, as a people, go all in. I think this is really clear in the story of Ruth. Doug touched on Ruth last week, just briefly. Uh, she pledges herself to her mother-in-law, Naomi, following the deaths of all the men in their lives. With Naomi, she returns to Israel and they are reduced to the point of gleaning the fields after the harvest. Mosaic law says that you don't harvest all the way to the fence, and there's always some of the grain that's left over and not picked, and the poor could come and glean the fields afterwards. And Ruth and Naomi are surviving by gleaning. And they can be sustained that way for a while. But there comes a time when the crops have been in for a while and the land has been searched over and over again. And gleaning doesn't work in the fallow time of the year. There will come a point when there's nothing left. Now, while this is going on, the landowners and their servants are busy threshing the grain for storage through those times when you can't take it out in the field. They will have a safety net. But there's no such thing as a safety net for the widows and the sojourners. Thus, Naomi hatches a plan. And that plan is far outside the box, outside the boxes that we tend to associate with Scripture. If you were to do word studies in the Hebrew, you would find that this text is just packed with sexual innuendo. Here's the plan. Go find Boaz, get him drunk, and offer yourself to him on his terms and see what happens. 
That's Naomi's plan. There are three outcomes. Two of them are bad and very bad. If, if Ruth goes through with this plan, Boaz could simply absolutely reject her and announce that she's a harlot and make her totally unwelcome in the community. The second, even worse, is that if she does what he offers, he takes advantage of her and then announces she's a harlot and pushes her to the outskirts of the society. And three is what happens. He recognizes Ruth as kin and fulfills the demand of the law, the Mosaic law, not the laws of the state of Texas. And he throws his robe over her, quite literally and figuratively. Ruth does as Naomi instructs, and the line of succession survives, and God's plan, in retrospect, remains intact. We tend to pass over stories like this. We, we treat them lightly. We don't linger over the despair that drives people to this kind of decision. And too often from our distant, distant perch, we jump on the first of those three choices and choose conventional righteousness over the pathos of real life. I like things neat. And I like them orderly. And I want a border and I want immigration laws that make sense. that are easy to understand and deserve to be obeyed. And then I see people who have no more hope than Ruth and Naomi in the gleaning time. I don't want to throw away the laws of the land, but I also don't want to throw away the Ruths who live in desperate times. And then we come to Jesus' widow. We're quick to adopt the adjective poor. She's a poor widow. I looked at 50, 5 zero, 50 English translations of this text from Mark. And every one of them translates that adjective as poor. But the Greek word is rooted not in a lack of money. That Greek word, prochos, is tied to the idea of being bent over, of cowering, a word associated with, lifting, uh, with living in fear and in helplessness, depending on others for any and everything to be reduced to begging. Yes, it means poor, but it's easy to forget the implications of being poor. The word suggests having no control over your own life. People, it helps you if you understand the roots of that word to understand how people use the very last of their resources to buy a lottery ticket or to leave their home in the hope of something better in an unwelcoming land. As some would say, there comes a point when you have to live on a wing and a prayer. It's easy to condemn people for not living with prudence. It's easy to say they should have. They, they, they could have. If only they would have. But the reality is they didn't. That's the point. What happens in the here and now is happening to people who have fouled up in the past. Maybe us. 
people that have dropped out of school at the age of 14, or people who have made the terrible decision to be born to people who have dropped out of school at 14. or chosen to be born in the wrong place and in a bad time. Still, the past is the past. And in the present, because of the past, people grow desperate. And people do desperate things in desperate times. It's either that or lay down and die. God created and walked with people in the garden and the people ceased to listen and God's plan appeared to be thwarted. Then God chose and called for himself a people. Noah, Abraham, through Joseph, called a people to be a light to the world and to reveal a way to live with God. But in every case, jealousy and rivalries divided those people God had called again and again. And God's plan appeared to be thwarted. God chose Moses to lead the people into a new beginning. They came out of Egypt. God provided law to guide them. But people sought to serve other gods and valued earthly success over being a people for God. And again, God's plan appeared to be thwarted. God sent prophets to warn people of the consequences of their actions. And they drove the prophets away or killed them outright. And Israel and Judah all but vanished from the earth. And again, God's plan appeared to be thwarted. God brought the people back from exile. And he created a new beginning. But people chose their own ways. And injustice and division appeared to rule the earth. And God's plan appeared to be thwarted. I wonder, sometimes I wonder if God has ever felt bent over and cowered. I wonder if God has ever felt like giving up with us. I wonder if sending the Christ was a desperate, last-ditch, all-in attempt to keep the plan of salvation alive. I wonder if God identifies with those who are thwarted again and again and again by life. God came in Jesus and was crucified. And God's plan appeared to be thwarted. But God raised him up. And from that new beginning, God sent people to be the church and to keep the dream alive. We are the remnants of the apostles sent to desperate people in desperate times all the while perhaps being a desperate people ourselves. The question is, what does it mean for us to go all in in times like these? In this day and age, what does it mean to take the kind of gamble that Ruth takes or the widow takes or that Jesus takes and risk everything? in the hope and faith that God's plan will not and is not and never will be thwarted. This is the question that we need to reflect on as individuals, as a congregation, as citizens of the world. I can't give you the answers, but I can say that being poor 
does not mean necessarily the lack of money. And it can't be solved simply by throwing our money at the problems. That's not the bottom line. The bottom line is where our hearts go and where our faith is placed. And that shapes the way we live and it shapes the way we give. For you, what does it mean to go all in? Amen. I invite you to stand and say what we believe using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, and he descended. Third day he arose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of the saints, the forgiveness of sin, the resurrection of the body. Amen. Amen. de Granada Monte Sierra Campos de mi paz Para siempre adiós, adiós, para siempre adiós.
los ojos del alma enemigos, del alma enemigos. Mensajeros, hay mensajeros de un pecho. Sus playas vuelva su lado dorado, las aguas del olvido me habrán curado, y si así no sucede, triste de mí, triste de mí, a la patria que deo. de Granada Monte Sierra Campos de mi paz siempre adiós, adiós, para siempre adiós. Sam, Dominic, we thank you for being here with us. You have enriched our worship today. As we turn to our prayers of the people, I ask you, are there joys, concerns that you'd like us to deal with? For my father, Robert Leon in the hospital. Robert De Leon in the hospital. Others? Or Ziggy's mom. I invite you to be in an attitude of prayer. Lord, we gather because we have been called. We have been called to be a people for you. And that call does not relieve us of all earthly cares. It doesn't fix all of the problems that we experience in life. We still find our plans thwarted at times. We pray that we might never lose sight that you are a God who comes and comes again and comes again so that our lives might be renewed from every fall. We give you thanks that you bring hope into our world, a hope that transcends despair, a hope that even transcends death, with the promise that in your kingdom, all will be united again as it was in the beginning, will be now and ever shall be. Lord, make us aware of your presence and help us to reveal your presence to the world in which we share with others. We lift up those who have special needs this week those who are 
known to us dearly, those who are named aloud, those who are named only in the silence of our hearts. We also pray for people that we don't know, that we don't know personally. We pray for situations where brokenness seems to overpower any hope of light. And we pray for those situations with the confidence that you can and do and will transform brokenness into the wholeness that is your will for your creation. Be with us as we worship. Make our offerings of praise acceptable in your sight. And equip us with your spirit for the journey that lies ahead. In Christ we pray. Amen. We come to the table of the Lord. We're told in scripture that people will come from east and from west and gather at the table to be welcomed at the table. This is not the table of this church. It's not a Presbyterian table. It's the table of our Lord Jesus Christ. And he invites all who trust in him to partake of the resources and riches that God so freely gives. I invite you to join in the great thanksgiving. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. O Lord, it is right always to give you thanks and praise for the lives that we have been given. We pray that we might sense your presence in the midst of this world that you have created, that we are a people who are pointers to the love that you have poured out in so many ways, but especially in the life and death of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We remember that he gave himself for his disciples and through his disciples to all who would follow for the world. His life was laid down. We pray that we might be a people nourished by the message and the gifts we find through him, not for our own glory, not for our own benefits, but that we might be tools who go all in to reveal your realm, a realm that covers this world, a realm that surpasses anything that we might see or know. We pray that we might be faithful followers of the way, the way that Christ came to reveal. Hear us now as we unite our voices to pray the prayer our Lord taught, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts. We forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. On that night when Jesus gave himself up, he gathered at table with his disciples. He took bread, and in their presence he broke the bread. And he said, this bread is my body broken for you. Take, eat, all of you. And in the same way, following the meal, after he again gave thanks, 
he took the cup and he poured it out and he said, this is the blood of the new covenant shed for your sins and the sins of many. As often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes again. The feast is prepared for those that can come to the table. You are invited to come. We have bread wafers that are um, here, if that's your choice, that are sealed, sanitized, and gluten-free. We have cut pieces of bread and the cup are in sealed containers. I invite you to come down these outside uh, aisles and return uh, around the outside. The feast is set. Come. Let us pray. O oh Lord, you have given yourself for us. Now we give ourselves for others. As a people of love, help us to serve you with joy now and through all the age to come. In Christ we pray. Amen. Our hymn of commitment is leaning on the everlasting arms. You are invited, if you have not done so, to bring your um, uh, commitment for stewardship, both of time and talents of money for the next year, and place them in the offering plate uh, during the hymn or following the benediction uh, along with your offerings from today. God bless you for being a people of service. Our hymn is number 837.
Depart in peace, assured of the presence of God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And may God's blessing be with each of you, now and forever. Amen.